All right, Luke Acts for beginners. This is lesson number seven in this series. Title of the lesson, Jesus Facing Jerusalem, part two of this section that we're covering. And we're going to do Luke chapter 12, verse one to Luke 14, six. So we're looking at the, uh, the part of Luke's gospel where he describes the events that occurred as Jesus was transitioning his ministry from the northern part of the country near Galilee to the south where the city of Jerusalem is uh, located. And we noted that as he drew near the holy city, which housed the temple, of course, and the religious leaders, or the, you know, they were, many of them uh, lived near and in the city, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, we notice that the opposition to him uh, and his teaching begin to grow. Uh, we left off at the end of chapter 11 where Luke records that these leaders were actively plotting to trap him in what he might say. Uh, this because he had uh, denounced them for having rejected him and accusing him of uh, 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 demon possession. So in chapter 12, Jesus responds to the opposition that he's facing by warning his apostles about the schemes of these men. And he adds an admonition that being his disciple would be difficult and dangerous. Up until this time, things were going fairly well. He hadn't warned them you know, about the difficulties at hand, but as they, you know, as they drew closer to Jerusalem, uh, he uh, informs this of, uh, uh, informs them of this possibility or uh, <laughs> of this certainty. So he reassures them, however, with several uh, promises. First, uh, that their message will be heard. Yes, there'll be opposition, but your message will be heard. Uh, he says, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy but there's nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetop. So their message will eventually be heard despite the opposition uh, that they will face. Another thing he says to them, their power is greater. Continue reading, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So the power that they speak from and witness about is greater than the power that will uh, oppose them. Another thing he tells them, they are valuable. Reading verse six, are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So God considers them valuable, even if the world does not. And by the opposition that they will face, uh, they're going to think, wow, no, nobody is with us. You know, it's us against the world. So he reassures them that you are valuable. Maybe not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God you are. Another thing he tells them, faith is the main factor. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So faith in Christ will be the determining factor in judgment before God. Not religious power, not position, the position that you had on earth or wealth or anything like that. Faith will be the determining power. He goes on and tells them he will reject those who reject him. Luke 12, 10, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. So those who reject God's word, you know, that Jesus is the Messiah, by saying that he and his word are of Satan, will not be forgiven. And why? Because God is mean-spirited? Oh yeah, you said that, I'll never forgive. No, of course not. They won't be forgiven because they have rejected and blasphemed the only one who can actually save them. You know, it's like they burnt the bridge. The only bridge to heaven, they've burnt it down by blaspheming the one who could uh, ultimately save them. He also says, God will provide. God will provide. 
When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So God will provide the wisdom they need to proclaim and defend their faith when they are persecuted for it. They will be able to make a good witness under pressure, under duress. Remember, they're facing the priests, the scholars, the religious experts, they're fishermen, they're ordinary men. They're heading into the, you know, the holy city to defend the, the gospel. And so he reassures them, don't worry, I'll give you the wisdom that you need at the time and place that you will be needing it. So at this point, someone asks Jesus a question and this shifts his attention from warning his apostles about the attacks against them by the Pharisees to warning them about the dangers that were present in the world, dangers that threatened not only their ministry, but their souls as well. So now we move to the parable of the bigger barns. So let's move on, keep reading, verse 13. Uh, to 15, someone in the crowd, so he's, he's talked to his apostles, he's you know, warned them, encouraged them, supported them, then all of a sudden somebody asks a question. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to, to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge, an arbitrator uh, over you? Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possession. So the question implies that there's a dispute over money in this man's family. And this person wants Jesus to mediate. Now the Lord refuses to get involved because he's not one of the judges appointed to handle these legal matters. The Jews in that society, there were judges. They're the ones that handled those things. And he's saying, hey, who made me a judge? I'm not a judge. I'm a rabbi. I'm a teacher. But he does use the incident to teach the crowd about the problem that is probably causing the dispute, and that is greed. A short definition of greed, never having enough. Greed is not about being rich. It's okay to be rich. Greed is you never have enough, never have enough. And so his lesson is embedded in a parable. We go forward, verse 16, and he told them a parable based on the question, based on his answer, based on what he says the root of the problem here is. And he told him a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be married. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the story is a fairly simple one to understand. Rich man is blessed with an abundant harvest which makes him even richer. This increase in wealth presents a problem, how to maintain this wealth. The man solves the problem by increasing his storage capacity, bigger barns. And while he is contemplating how he will enjoy his increased wealth, he dies and his wealth goes to others. So where's the greed here, someone will say, where's the connection? Well, the rich man is not condemned because he was wealthy or because his fields produced a bountiful harvest, these were blessings. Now the sin comes when deciding about his increase, the things he did and the things he didn't do. So look, look at the things he did not do. He did not give thanks to God. Anywhere in the parable, no thanksgiving, no gratitude shown. He did not ask God for direction in the use of his increase. How shall I use this, Lord? He did not consider giving a portion to God as thanksgiving. He did not consider sharing with others in need. Let's look at the things he did do. Well, he kept it all for himself, didn't he? And he only made an effort to store it so he could benefit from it later on. He only considered how this new wealth would bless himself. 
and he assumed that he would live long enough to carry out his plans. So the greed here is seen in a person already rich, welcoming an increase in wealth only as an opportunity to maintain his lifestyle here in the world. There's the greed. The real danger of greed is that it moves us to act in ways that only consider the physical, more stuff. And usually more stuff equals safety. If I got more stuff, I'm more safe. Safe from poverty, safe from, you know, safe from the world, safe from dependence on someone else. You know, more stuff equals safety. And for some, more stuff equals happiness, more stuff equals success. With little or no regard for the spiritual aspect of life. So in verse 21, Jesus makes a comparison. The one that only stores physical wealth, that individual, he says, is not prepared for death and judgment. And then the one rich toward God, meaning the one rich and becoming wealthier in the things of God. What are the things of God? Forgiveness, righteousness, fruit of the spirit, ministry, generosity, those are the things of God. These people, he says, are more than ready for death and judgment. And what isn't said here is, if you're rich towards God, that really does equal safety. <laughs> that really does equal happiness. That really does equal contentment. So this parable <clears throat> naturally leads to a more in-depth discussion of the life led by someone who is rich toward God. And so in verses 22 to 34, which I'm not going to read, um, uh, Jesus uh, repeats the Beatitudes. He turns his attention from the question concerning the dispute between the brothers and their inheritance and the parable he presented as an answer and now he addresses the crowd in general. Luke records Jesus' repeating the lesson on the Beatitudes, which we know is originally recorded by Matthew in Matthew chapter five to seven, as the way to live if one is to be rich towards God. So he finishes the parable, you know, the man who is rich towards God, and then he goes on and recites the parables. He puts that section right there. And then in verse 34 finishes it up when he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So once he's completed his parable and teaching, Jesus follows up these remarks with a warning for all disciples and would-be disciples that they should always be in a state of readiness. So we keep reading verse 35. He says, be dressed in readiness. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Be dressed in readiness. Four words. Says it all, doesn't it? Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Pay attention. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and he knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly, I say to you, that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table, and will come up and wait on them, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, and finds them so. Blessed are those slaves. So the next passages describe the reason for and the nature of this readiness. So here he's, you know, it follows, right? The question, the parable, the lesson, the teaching, and now be ready, he says. You know, in, the, in the parable, the rich man died suddenly. He wasn't ready. So now he's talking about being ready. What is that supposed to be like? And ready for what and when? So in verse 12, he explains that, uh, verse 39. Be ready for what and when. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Ready for what? Well, ready for the coming of Christ at an unknown time. He comes for us either in death, like the rich farmer, or at the end of the world to judge. This is why we need to be in a constant state of readiness, because we don't, usually don't know when we're going to die, and we certainly don't know when He will return. Our only option is to be ready at all times. So ready for uh, what and when, ready for the judgment, 
at some time that we don't know, then ready for who and why? Let's read the passage. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Keep reading. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will, will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. So ready for who and why. Everyone should be ready, but especially those who know that uh, they can come at any time. He can come at any time. In the world, they're oblivious. But we in the kingdom, we've been warned. He's told us directly, be ready. You, you don't know when I'm coming, but be ready, be ready because I will. As I say, non-believers go about their business unaware, but disciples know that He will return at any time for the purpose of judgment. No excuses for us. Readiness is important because the judgment brings both reward and punishment. You know, I believe Jesus is referring to disciples here, and particularly teachers and elders, Preachers, deacons, those people, you know, they are the slaves who have received instruction and left to be stewards of God's word and the church. They have been given much. What have they been given? Well, they've been given gifts, spiritual gifts. They've been given a calling into ministry of one kind or another. They've been given opportunity for spiritual growth and blessings not given to others. And because of this, much will be required of them. Now this idea is also supported by James in James chapter 3 verse 1. James says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Now as to the greater and lesser punishment and rewards, Jesus states that these will be degrees of difference. There'll be degrees of difference. And Paul talks about this also in 1 Corinthians. I want to go over there for a moment. Verse 13 to 15, he says, each man's work will become evident. For the day, meaning the judgment, the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so, as through fire. So we do not, however, have any descriptions of what these differences are or will be, simply that there, there are differences. Well, let's go back to Luke chapter 12, 49. He says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Continue, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided three against two and two against three. They'll be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So here he reveals that the battle will become extremely personal and as a result, very painful. Your ministry and your faith and your readiness challenged by those of your own household among those you love the most here on earth. And so in verses 54 to 59, again, I won't read that here, Jesus confirms his warning by reminding them to simply read the signs that he has cautioned them about as they appear in the future. Opposition, persecution, family division, and act accordingly. So how should I act accordingly? Well, stay ready. 
Stay ready. And so we have ready for what and when, who and why. So what? The end. When? We don't know. Who? The return of Jesus. Why? The judgment. And so in chapter 13, he adds one more. Ready? How? How? Whoop. There it is. Ready? How? So let's read. He says, uh, now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise uh, perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all of the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So, ready how? Well, repent, that's how. <laughs> repent. Repentance is the first step to discipleship. Repentance is a recurring exercise to produce spiritual growth that leads us to maturity. You know, it's a fallacy to think, on the day that I get baptized, I repent on that day. You know, I repent, I'm a sinner, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, you know, I repent. And then I'm immersed in the water, and then I'm saved. And then I never have to repent ever again in my life. False. No, no. repentance is a lifestyle. And I don't mean going around sorrowful, you know, dust, you know, ashes on your head and wearing a potato sack and being miserable. I'm saying being open to the spirit within you who will throughout your entire life, our entire lives as Christians, throughout our entire life, the Holy Spirit will be pointing out things in your life that you need to repent of, that you need to change. I don't know about you, but in my own experience, there are times in my prayer moments when I realized that there are sins in my past that I haven't completely understood and acknowledged and repented of. I was forgiven then, but all of a sudden, after you know, so many decades of being a Christian and reading the word and hearing lessons and all that business, all of a sudden I go, oh, that sin, that thing. Wow, that was way more serious than I ever thought that it was. I was really guilty in that affair, that whole business that took place. I see the role that I played. I was immature, I was selfish, I was proud. I see it now. Lord, forgive me for that. I repent of that. That's what I'm talking about. That ongoing examination of ourselves through the lens of the Spirit that helps us change, understand how we were and how God wants us to be. So Jesus here, he's speaking mainly to the crowd. He emphasizes the first and then most productive spiritual exercise without which there can be absolutely no salvation and no subsequent spiritual growth. Everybody needs to repent. Here he's saying, even the Pharisees. So how do I get ready? How am I ready? Repent. Number two, be productive. Let's read that, verse six. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down, why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, Cut it down. So in this parable, the vineyard and the tree are the Jewish nation. The vine dresser is Jesus, and the master is the father bringing judgment. So the nation has been receiving care for three years with the preaching of John and Jesus to bear fruit of repentance because the kingdom is at hand. The Jews, especially the religious leaders, have rejected both John and Jesus. They killed one and they're planning to kill the other. The judgment on the nation is imminent, but Jesus calls for more time. Why? Well, because he hasn't died, he hasn't resurrected yet, he hasn't empowered his apostles to go preach the full gospel yet. Give him time. 
This is the extra year in the parable given to see if there will be a harvest of repentance among the Jews and faith in them as a result of all these things. Now we know from history that it was not so. And in 70 AD, the judgment of God did fall on the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants as the Roman army laid siege to it, killed the inhabitants, burned down the city, tore the temple down to ruins. This was the cutting down of the fig tree that Jesus just described in the parable. And so Jesus completes a section of teaching through parables to His disciples that they should always be ready by bearing the good fruit of faith because He will return to judge when least expected. Within this warning is included an additional prophecy of judgment and punishment on the Jews for their lack of faith. So we move on. Next section. Next section is built by placing two instances of Jesus' healing on the Sabbath on either ends with several teaching sections in between. It's interesting to note that Luke is the only gospel writer to add these healings to his record. So he's unique in describing these things. So the first healing on the Sabbath, chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. So her problem was that she was possessed or attacked by a demon. And her symptom was being bent over, suffering in this way for 18 years. And Jesus releases her from her demon possession and the symptom of its presence is removed as well. She, as a woman of faith, because she was attending synagogue, despite her embarrassing symptom, she breaks forth in praise to God. God gets the credit for this miracle as he should. Now let's read verse 14. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. So the official could not deny the miracle, and think about it for a second now. He may have been witness to this woman suffering for 18 years with no cure, but Jesus' miracle might stir up the crowd and he may lose control. Because leaders such as this man, the thing they like is control, not service, control. So the word indignant means an anger caused by some insult or challenge. So this woman had suffered 18 years and may have had many prayers offered on her behalf by this very synagogue leader. Now Jesus come, comes along and in an instant, she is healed to the joy and amazement of the congregation. So he tries to kind of cover his anger and possible envy by citing the rules about medical work. There were rules. Doctors could attend to emergencies on the Sabbath, but not treat various chronic conditions on that day. In other words, no doctor's office on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, doctor's office was closed. So this is what he's citing here, this particular rule. Verse 15 and 16. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? So Jesus calls his, at, uh, calls his attitude for what it is, hypocrisy. You know, it was custom to feed animals on the Sabbath, they had to be untied or released from their pens in order to do so. Jesus simply equates the two in order to reveal the double standard. You know, free an animal to drink, that's okay. Free a faithful woman from painful bondage, oh no, no, that's not okay. You gotta follow the rules on that one. <laughs> it's so plainly obvious, so plainly obvious. And so in verse 17, 
As he said this, all the opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. I don't know, I can almost see it. I can almost feel it. You know, the ordinary people who saw through many of the foolish and hypocritical rules and regulations of the Pharisees, but they were afraid to challenge them, they rejoice because someone is finally taking them on, not just with words, but with power. You know, I could just see the people, you go Jesus, oh yes, take it to them, take it to them. <laughs> so Luke mentions the humiliation of the religious leaders. This incident will fuel their hatred of him and move them to plot to kill him. So remember I said there was a healing, some teaching, another healing, so here's the teaching. The teaching is the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, verse 18, 21, we won't read that. These two, mustard seed and the leaven, I think we're familiar with it. In uh, previous sections, Jesus had issued warnings about being ready because the kingdom was at hand. Here, he provides two brief parables showing what the kingdom is like. First, it's like a mustard seed and a plant. And the point he makes is that the mustard seed grows dynamically, if you wish, quickly and it grows large, so it can provide shade and shelter for many birds and, and animals. And then another one about leaven. Its growth is unseen, but sure. Its presence affects all of its surroundings. So he said the kingdom is like these two things, like the mustard seed, it grows quickly and it, it, it provides shelter. Like leaven, you, you can't see it, but you can see the results of it. It's all around you. And then the, uh, uh, the teaching of the narrow gate, verses 22 to 30. Again, no time to read that. Hopefully you've read it ahead of time. Luke adds another teaching section that is also included in Matthew and Mark's gospel. The call to enter by the narrow door or the narrow gate or the narrow way, which is Jesus Himself. This continues to be Jesus' invitation to people. Believe in Him. Uh, instead of saying, believe in me, he will say, enter the narrow door. Why is it narrow? Well, because the leaders and, and the smart people and, and the majority, they don't believe in him. That's what makes him the narrow way. The gate, the way. So this repeated call accomplishes two things. One, it offers a clear choice to those who see his miracles and hear his teaching. And two, it condemns those who reject him, especially the religious leaders. And then there is his lament over Jerusalem, verse 31 to 35. As he approaches the city, tensions are mounting and the religious leaders try to turn him away by warning him that Herod means to capture and kill him. They're saying, oh, you don't want to come to town. You better get out of here. Herod's after you. And Jesus merely sends a message to the wicked king telling him that God's plan for Jesus to minister must be fulfilled and that he is not worried about being killed here in the outskirts of Jerusalem. He's in the area of Perea at the time because Jerusalem is where the prophets go to die. That's not a joke, but it's a little bit of dark humor. <laughs> it's impossible for me to die outside of Jerusalem because that's where they kill all the prophets in the past. Boy, what a hit that is. This was an observation about the number of past prophets who were put to death by the very same type of religious leaders. So I'll just read 34 and five. Uh, excuse me, verse 34 and 5. He says, oh, and here's the lament, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he finishes with a sad lament over the suffering that the city and the nation will experience because of their rejection of the Messiah. And of course, history bears this out, mentioned before, the destruction of the city just a few years into the future. Remember I said, you know, a healing, some teachings, which we've had another healing. So here's the other healing in Luke 14. We'll read about that. It says, it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? 
but they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. So the term dropsy only appears here in the New Testament. It was a disease we now refer to as edema, which is a swelling of the legs and the feet or hands due to excessive fluid in the tissues. Uh, it's the only time that we see Jesus heal this uh, particular illness. Now the scenario is the same as the first healing on the Sabbath, except this one is done in a private home, not in a synagogue, and no one there challenges him. They're silent. Now the fact that it was a Pharisee's home and they were watching closely along with the presence of a sick man, who by the way, if you notice, offered no thanks and no rejoicing. So you, know, you, you kind of think he was just like a plant. You know, Jesus coming over to the Pharisee's house, it says they were watching to see what he would do. Well, what he would do about what? Well, what he would do about the obviously sick person in the room. Notice that when he heals him, he doesn't talk to him. The, the sick person doesn't say, oh Lord, please help me, nothing. He sees the sick guy, boom, he heals him. The sick guy is healed and leaves. No word of thanks, no, no nothing. So this suggests that this was a setup in order to gather eyewitnesses and evidence against him for future use. All right, we're going to stop right there. Heard the bell, a couple of lessons and we'll wrap it up. So Jesus is becoming more pointed in his denunciations of the religious leaders and more adamant in his demand for faithfulness and fruitfulness from his disciples. So two lessons stand out, for me anyways, in this section. Lesson one, no fruit, no life. No fruit, no life. Being alive and remaining alive in Christ requires that we be fruitful in faith and good works, pure living, ministry, there's no neutral gear in Christianity. We are either moving away from something or we're moving towards something, but we never, we're never able to stand still. We're only fooling ourselves if we think, well, I'm, I'm in a good place here, I'm just going to stand still. No, no, no fruit, no life. Second lesson, only two, the truth hurts. I mean, the Pharisees were standing right in front of Jesus, but their envy and anger stirred up by His teaching and miracles blinded them to the truth that could save them. Here's the person who could actually save them. Here's the person, all their teachings, all their preachings were supposed to prepare the people for this very person. And they were plotting to kill Him because they, their, their pride and their, their hurt you know, feelings about Him pointing out their sins. Uh, didn't allow them to uh, grasp the truth that was before them. So the truth that the word reveals about our lives is often painful and embarrassing, but if we can get around that to let the truth lead and heal and inform us, we will grow stronger and more pleasing to God. Spiritual growth can be uncomfortable, but it is always worth it. It's always worth the price. Okay. Reading assignment next time, Luke chapter 14, verse seven, to Luke 17, verse 10. I encourage you to read that. It will make this lesson much more profitable for you because you'll be familiar with the material. Great, thank you very much for your attention. We're done, thank you.